Okay, so in this lecture, we're going to talk about sizeism. So when we think about sizeism, or before we get into it, I want folks to think about this particular word, fat, right? Throughout our history um, in US America, this word has been a very stigmatizing word as well. Um, so when we think about this word, uh, keep in mind that this word has been used to uh, stigmatize people who are obese or who are of size. It's important to recognize too that this word is starting to be used in a different way as a way of reclaiming, um, as a way of description compared to uh, it being a word to oppress people. Um, so when we go throughout the lecture, if you see the words fat, um, uh, if you see the words fat, I encourage you to make note of the emotions that are coming up for you when this word is being used. We also have to go into some key terms. Um, fat studies. So this is an interdisciplinary field of scholarship that has been um, marked by aggressive and consistent um, rigorous critique of the negative assumption, stereotype, and stigma placed on the term fat and the fat body. Um, so to be quite clear, I mentioned earlier it's a way of reclaiming. That's in essence what it is. It's reclaiming this term fat as an embodied location in which uh, we theorize for social change. The Goldilocks rule. Um, this basically refers to a preference for judging aesthetics, health, and suitability for size. I'm gonna get into the Goldilocks rule a little bit later, um, but this is just an introductory term. So if you think about uh, the term, when, when we think about the tale Goldilocks, right? You had this girl break into some houses, break into the house of, some, of a family of bears, and she ate their food, slept in their bed, and sat on their chairs. Um, so holding that in mind, uh, hold that and we're going to move forward when we get to the Goldilocks rule. Size discrimination. So basically this is the allocation of valued good and resources based upon one's size. In particular, it privileges people who are, um, who are thin, who, and marginalizes people who are, uh, who are considered to be obese or, um, or of size. So when we think about sizeism, this is basically the discrimination against people based upon their body weight and their shape. Um, it's rooted in healthism. So when we think about healthism, sizeism is right underneath it. Um, when we think about sizeism though, a lot of times people tend to think about um, the impact of people who are obese, people who are bigger. It's important to note that people who are thin are also stigmatized um, within sizeism. Um, people that we consider to be quote unquote too skinny or too thin or um, bony, we see them as uh, we see them as disordered. Uh, so if we think about anorexia nervosa, so this is a psychological disorder. Uh, it's an eating disorder specifically that is marked by uh, really restrictive eating intake. That person um, who is who has this disorder, um, you can see their bones. Um, however, when we think about people who are thin, there's this quick assumption that that person they don't eat, um, they restrict their eating habits, they're anorexic, so forth and so on. And it's important to note that uh, with psychological disorders, specifically with anorexia. Um, it's this particular disorder is fairly rare. Um, it's considered to be part of the extreme eating. Um, so people who are thin, if they are eating, um, eating an average, uh, average to a size, excuse me, if they're eating the amount of food that is average to them, um, and they just they might have a fast metabolism, then that's not disordered eating. So I want us to be clear about that. Sizeism doesn't just focus about people who are who are obese or people who are considered to be fat. 
it also stigmatizes people who are uh, what we consider to be too thin. So that's where that Goldilocks rule come, Goldilocks rules come in. There's this preference for people who are, um, when we think about this preference for people who are uh, thin or obese, it's not there. Uh, so it basically with the Goldilocks rule, if you're too thin or if you're too big, you're not right. But if you're right in the middle, you're good. You're, you're, you're healthy. So now we're going to talk about the history of sizeism. So in early history, um, being a person of size, being curvy, that was a sign of health and wealth. In earlier times, um, food wasn't available to everyone. And if you were a person of size, uh, that meant that you had money, you had the resources to get food. So you were seen as, you were seen as a person of worth if you were um, a bigger size. However, with the change in US economy, food was starting to become a lot more available, a lot more affordable to everyone. And people who were of the working class, they were able to, obtain food and as we started seeing this shift right we started uh, there was this stigma or there was this loss of appeal of people who were bigger and before we knew it there was this loss of prestige if you were um, if you were bigger if you're a person of size however um, within the 1920s or so, we started seeing this emergence of preference for people who were thinner. Uh, and with this preference, people who were slender, they were considered to be prestigious. And then with that, um, with, the growing, uh, with the growing emergence of science into, uh, healthcare, into this healthcare field, we started seeing this reinforcement, not only by the media, but by um, the medical field, right? Uh, so when we think about figures like uh, Marilyn Monroe, Marilyn Monroe, she wasn't, I'll be clear, she wasn't a thin woman, she was a thick woman. Um, however, she also was not um, an, obese, an obese woman either. Uh, so taken together, Marilyn Monroe, as an example, was a person who was just right. Um, so going back to that Goldilocks role, right? Um, and the media, and, and what we've seen of Marilyn Monroe, she's blasted into the media, right? She was seen as this, um, as this beauty icon. With science, we started seeing medical doctors make these measurements of, of folks, right? We had the body, uh, body measurement index, the BMI. And it's important to note that there was this generalization of this particular size to everybody else in America. So while the standard was like a person who is, uh, who might be a, who might be a size eight, right? Um, if that's the standard and if no one else meets that standard, they're either too, uh, they're either too thin or they're too, uh, are there to obese? Are there obese? Right. Um, and so, taken together, we've taken science and we've used this approach, this one size fits all approach, to people of various sizes. It's important to note that not everybody is like that standard, um, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. So, to the left um, is Jillian Michaels and. Uh, the famous Lizzo. Um, Jillian Michaels was on a talk show and she was, we, they were talking about Lizzo and Jillian Michaels made a comment, um, a very uh, fat shaming co comment, very sizes comment um, about people wanting to celebrate Lizzo um, for her body. She specifically said, um, it's not gonna be cool when she gets diabetes. So taken together, there were a lot of people who were very, very offended by that. Um, and it's very important to, to look at why people were offended. And when we think about people who are of size, 
and when I mean of size, people who are obese, people who are um, people who are bigger, there are a lot of negative attitudes. So with that specific comment that Jillian Michaels made, it's this assumption that your it's assumption that your size predicts your health status. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but let's go into the negative attitudes. So these negative attitudes are very much reinforced by the media, right? We see a lot of advertisements about weight loss and these testimonials of people who are, uh, who are happier as a result of their weight loss. So within the media, what we see is this message um, that communicates to people, if you are slender, if you are thinner, you're going to be happier, right? We've also seen this notion of confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is basically like uh, you have the information that confirms your beliefs. Within U.S. America, a lot of people, um, uh, what we have seen is people taking what they see on TV, what they see in articles for, uh, for their own confirmation on their beliefs. So when you have this by the media, it confirms people's beliefs and further reinforces that belief. And it makes it harder to change those attitudes and those beliefs at the same time. Negative attitudes towards people who are bigger and people who are thinner are fairly common. Um, we make a lot of jokes about people who are of size and people who are thinner, right? Um, when we think about Family Guy, for example, there are many times whenever you hear people call Peter Griffin a fat bastard. Um, you've also seen people make jokes about uh, Chris Griffin's weight on the show. There also have been like uh, jokes about models who are relatively thin, um, as if like whenever they turn to the side, you'll barely, you'll miss them, right? So when we think about sizes, uh, negative sizes, attitudes, they're fairly common, um, it, especially in our day-to-day -day conversations with people. With these attitudes, they are maintained by several different things. So they're maintained by the stereotypes of people who are obese, and who are thin. So this goes back to the media. We do see a lot of uh, negative representations of people who are, um, who are obese, people who are uh, bigger, and people who are, who are small, who are thinner, right? With these stereotypes, think about the negative stereotypes of people who are, uh, who are of bigger size. What are the first things that come to your mind? What about people who are thinner? With these stereotypes in mind, these stereotypes maintain these attitudes. Aesthetic preferences also um, maintain these attitudes. So when we're looking into, um, when we're looking at modeling, right? Uh, on the Victoria's Secret, for many, many years in Victoria's Secret, we had not seen a model who was a person of size. Um, we've typically seen models who are rather thin, right? M people who model lingerie, um, they, wear, they are typically thinner, um, and it's important to note that they don't really look like that in real life. Um, the image that you see on Victoria's Secret, uh, yeah, they don't look like that in real life. They still do the touching up, right? They still do the, um, they still do the editing on that person's photos. So when we look, when we have people that take pictures, there are some models who might be thin. They might have cellulite, um, and people don't consider cellulite as uh, as pretty, as aesthetically pleasing. So it's important to note that within the media, there are the preferences for thinner bodies. And when we think about um, different oppressions, right, sizeism does intersect with classism as well as sexism. So when we think about that, it's really important to consider uh, the ways in which different oppressions interact to get this unique experience. When we look at it with women, right, um, 
women are expected to be a certain size, a thinner size, right? Um, back whenever I was growing up, uh, you saw a lot of thinner women. Now you're seeing the emergence of thick women. Um, while you do have the appreciation of women with, uh, with bigger bodies, women with, um, with curvier bodies, there's still that limitation that is placed by sexist attitudes. Uh, women who have a bigger bust, thinner waist, bigger butt, right? Um, that is in essence what we're seeing uh, for women. Now, for different types of women, it's rather different. But we're going to talk about that when we get to intersectionality. Also to keep in mind too, with men um, of size, what we started seeing now is this emergence of the appreciation of the dad bod. Um, so with this, right, men who are conceptualized as like having this dad bod, they're seen as favorable compared to other men. However, what we do see with men, there's this expectation for men to be a bigger size, but to be muscular as well. Um, so that that's one of the ways in which it's very different for men, um, men identified folks and women identified folks, but we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. It's also maintained um, by this belief that body size is equated with responsibility and health. So I mentioned the comment between Jillian Michaels, uh, the, the comment of, uh, from Jillian Michaels, right? She said that it wouldn't be great that, you know, it wouldn't be great when she gets diabetes. And it's this immediate belief that, not immediate belief, but it's rooted in this belief that a person's size um, predicts their health status. Now, here's the caveat, right? We do have research, we do have like medical research to suggest that um, there is this association between obesity and hypertension, um, cardiovascular diseases and so forth and so on. However, it's whenever we take that research or we take that belief and we say that like, that's the only thing that's going to predict a person's health. That's not the only thing that's going to predict a um, uh, predict cardiovascular diseases and hypertension, right? You have to think about a person's genetics, um, genetics and so forth and so on. So to say that obesity is the only predictor of cardiovascular disease, that's not true. And that's where we see a lot of people hold these strong, hold these beliefs very, very strongly. So what I want to, I want y'all to know is that, um, just because you, you're a person of size or you're thinner, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get a certain physical uh, disease or disorder, so forth and so on. There's also this belief that body size is rooted in a personal responsibility. So when we talk about people who are obese, people who are thin, right? we all there's this discourse that it's all on them that uh the responsibility of who they are of their size is only on them and they are at fault when they uh when they are that size so let's go back to the media um whenever we see tv shows like my Hunt, my 600 pound life sent while while there is this this wanting, this desire to show that people can make these changes, it's important to note too that um, that at the center of their weight loss uh, is that it's their fault, um, and that they had their personal responsibility. We do see that stigmatization of those folks. And the biggest one is that it's rooted in healthism. So remember when we talked about healthism, um, this is basically the system that privileges people who are conceptualized that's healthy. Um, so with healthism, it's reinforced by um, this over by this heavy medicalization of the human body. So taken together, when we look at the human body, um, 
and only look at it from a, an over-medicalized standpoint, there's this conception that a, person's, uh, a person who is of size, they have to be protected from themselves uh, by a medical doctor and so forth and so on. So we do have some explicit and implicit studies that have looked at um, attitudes towards folks who are obese um, in particular. So with explicit attitude study, studies, basically you just ask a person like, do they agree with certain items, so forth and so on. However, the issue with, uh, with these studies is that uh, it typically underestimates the extent of sizeism. If you think about it, so if you think about social desirability, this is one of those factors. Um, people don't want to convey themselves as who they really are, depending upon the topic. Um, so when we think about cases like discrimination and um, discrimination and uh, these other uh, in negative attitudes, people want to convey that they are that they hold uh, less negative attitudes than what they really do. So folks have not only looked at explicit uh, attitude studies, they've looked at implicit attitude study. So this is basically used to bypass critical thinking. So what the implicit uh, attitude studies do, they show these pictures of, of people who are fat or people who are thin, and it asks people to assign certain characteristics um, to that person in the image. So these might include motivated or lazy or good or bad. And it's also important to note that it's timed. So the faster that a person associates an image with the word, that's how, um, that's how unconscious it is, okay? So what have we found? What we have found is that um, the stereotypes of obese folks, they impact healthcare professionals' attitudes towards obese patients. So hold on, because this is a really, really big deal, right? Um, these studies show uh, that uh, these experts associate fat people with being lazy, being bad, being stupid, and being worthless. Um, when we look at physicians and nutritionists, they associate fat people with being lazy or um, having low motivation. Personal trainers and PE teachers are also like susceptible to sizeism. So they show high levels of implicit sizeism. So taken together, when we're looking at implicit attitudes, people are, people do associate um, certain characteristics with people who are fat or obese. Now with explicit studies, in dietitians, um, they agreed that people who are obese were unattractive, insecure, and slow and inactive. Also having lower self-esteem, poor self-control, low endurance. Amongst physicians, they agreed that um, obese clients uh, are non-compliant, -compl they're less self-disciplined, and worse at taking care of themselves than other, um, other patients. Psychologists, um, they expected more mental health problems with, uh, with clients who were obese compared to uh, compared to non-obese clients, and that these mental health problems would be more difficult to address. So what do these findings mean for sizeism in healthcare? Um, basically, this shows to accept that uh, healthcare providers believe that it's acceptable to express their attitudes towards um, their patients, right? Um, so if you're going into, the, uh, in going into a doctor's office and they're saying, and you're going in for some kind of breathing problem, that doctor is more likely going to say, man, I mean, if you could lose a few pounds, you might breathe better. Um, and then you're also mentioning some other things. The doctor continuously references to, um, to your weight problem or to, uh, or to your problem being a weight, to your, blah, 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 to your weight being a problem. Now, in certain cases, when it comes to respiratory issues, Weight can be a problem, but it is not the only contributor. 
If we have science to say that it is the main primary contributor, great. But that's not the only thing that contributes to a person's um, breathing problems, right? So taken together, what I'm trying to say is, uh, whenever this the whenever there's this consistent and persistent uh, 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 approaches to people with uh, people who are obese, saying that their weight is the primary is the problem, um, and is the only problem that needs to be solved, then that's a problem. Implicit attitudes may leak. And when I mean leak, they result in microaggressions. Um, so this might be conveyed as a doctor's um, reluctance to touch a patient um, who is obese and shaking their head or making noises while weighing their patients. And if you, if you think about it, that's pretty stressful. We're gonna talk about the, the impact of these microaggressions um, uh, on people of size. It can cause a delay in seeking healthcare. Uh, so people who people who are obese or people who are thin, when they perceive these these uh, microaggressions, it actually discourages them from wanting to uh, seek out medical treatment, seek out healthcare. It can also result in a misdiagnosis. So I gave the example earlier about the respiratory concern. Um, by attributing a person's respiratory concern or their health concern with their weight, it runs the potential of misdiagnosing a person. Um, so saying that a person should just lose weight to um, solve their respiratory problems might be a concern if the problem is in fact the tumor. Lastly, when it comes to the med when it comes to medical doctors, uh, it's unethical in a form of malpractice. Um, even with psychologists, psychologists holding that attitude, it is very much unethical because it's stated in the guidelines that, you know, you want to make sure you're not being discriminatory towards clients and patients and so forth and so on. So we have studies to show people's attitudes towards people who are obese. Now let's look at what, let's look at the impacts of sizeism on people who are obese. So what's proposed is this perceived unfairness model. So basically in this model, there's this experience of prejudice and discrimination um, and it's observed directed at one social group. Now this perceived prejudice, discrimination, right? it can create psychological and physiological processes. Um, we've had research to show that it does have direct effects on heart and lung functioning. Uh, when we think about uh, this perceived model, when we think about perceived discrimination and uh, prejudice, it can facilitate stress. Uh, microaggressions are really stressful. Um, I think we've talked about that a lot in the past couple lectures. With stress, it does have some direct and indirect effects. Um, so you have lower immune systems, right? Um, and cognitive impairments such as attention and thinking. Uh, if you're familiar with the HPA axis, right? The hypothalamic pituitary uh, adrenal gland axis, right? HPA when the body experiences stress the hpa kicks into gear and it provides a uh it provides a stress response that allows the body to cope with that stressor um with that stress right until it's over however what we see is uh, when you experience greater amounts of stress the hpa access can actually be damaged um, the hypothalamus is really important for memory, uh, not memory, uh, excuse me, but for homeostasis. So the regulation of the body temperature, endocrine system, um, feeding, so forth and so on, it actually becomes damaged by the increased levels of, uh, increasing and enduring levels of cortisol. You also see damage to the hippocampus. The hippocampus is really important for memory formation. 
So when we see these enduring levels of cortisol, right, um, when that person is continuously experiencing this stress, it damages the hippocampus and it can result in memory impairment. So a couple slides ago, I mentioned intersectionality. This one is really big because everybody's oppression is different when we consider their different identities. So I mentioned men and women um, a couple slides ago. When we think about, um, when we think about uh, uh, how race intersects with, um, with body size, right? There's this, uh, there's, this there's this sense of fear associated with certain folks. So seeing a big black guy, right? So whenever we hear about stories of, um, stories of burglaries or of, um, uh, especially, and um, excuse me, I lost my train of thought, uh, police brutality, um, we do see the characterization of black folks as being big and heavy. Right. Uh, when we think about uh, Eric Garner, for example, Eric Garner was a person of size. He was a bit bigger. Um, and also Alton Sterling. Alton Sterling was a bigger guy. He was a bit heavier set. Um, and it's important to note that both were killed by the police. What we have seen with studies is that the uh, the bigger the person um and uh, if their race is black, we've seen police, uh, we've seen implicit biases to, we, with the studies that we have. Uh, it shows that there is a sense of fear experienced by the participants, uh, especially when they're police cops, uh, especially when they're policemen, police cops, cops. So taken together, it's important to note that when we think about other identities, it gets really complicated. Um, so that's pretty much it. Another one, um, right, so we talked about physiological processes, and we're going to talk about what that, uh, we talked about physiologic processes, and we talked about um, like external stressors, let's talk about internal stressors. So internalization. Um, what we see for people of size, there's this internalization of the thin ideal, and they tend to blame themselves for their weight. They, uh, they also see themselves as, um, as not worthy, so forth and so on, and they have lower self-esteem. And we also notice that they're they're very vulnerable to their social to, to, to very vulnerable to different social identities, right? Um, so being a person of size and being a woman, right? That's very different compared to being a person of size and being a man. Uh, and what I mean by that, when we think about the value that we place on men and women, um, respectively, that can result in these different. Uh, in different vulnerabilities, but they still result in a vulnerability. Some indirects, uh, indirect effects of sizeism on health. We have studies to show that obese folks, they've been treated very, very wrongly um, in the healthcare system. And what we have seen is results in lower trust in physician advice and reluctance to make return visits. Also, delay in seeking health, uh, seeking health care due to perceived weight discrimination, and the reasons being that uh, you know weight gain since the previous visit, not wanting to be weighed, knowing that they would be told to lose weight, and this has and this delay has been linked to higher mortality and poor self-rated health. Lastly, frequent sizeism can lead to weight gain and avoidance of exercise. So taken together, what we see with sizeism is that not only does it impact the attitudes of, uh, you know, people who, it, who is targeted and people who are non-targeted, it also impacts people's behaviors um, and their, uh, their trust within the healthcare field or trust towards healthcare providers. Direct effects. Weight-related barriers to seeking treatment. Um, when we think about a doctor's office, right? 
um, if it's, it's really difficult to access doctor's office if there are too many stairs, um, the furniture, clothing, and equipment um, not being large enough for that person, right? So if we have like these chairs, chairs, it, chairs can fit a certain size of a person. Um, if you think about it, you have a person, you have a client who is um, of size and you have like this meaty, this like this chair and they are not able to sit. If you think about it, that's kind of embarrassing. Um, that's embarrassing for that person. And imagine how they, you know, imagine how that person feels. And at the same time, the doctor or the other, the person on the other side of the table is saying, lose weight. So that's like added stressors. Denial of healthcare services because of weight. Negative attitudes of providers. So this goes, so these two go hand in hand with one another. Um, we have seen people who uh, have been refused services due to their weight. Um, and some of the time it is very much related to doctors' um, implicit biases towards people who are of size. So for providers, they may spend less time with patients, they may have um, less patients, and they may provide less health education than to other patients. Now this one is kind of funny because you would think that they'd be espouting more health education to these patients uh, who are of size, but you actually see the opposite. Instead, what you hear is more of lose weight, lose weight, lose weight, but not necessarily how to do it or, um, you know, more affirming uh, advice. It also may not allow sufficient time for patients to ask questions or describe their symptoms. And this can often lead to a misdiagnosis uh, or some patient misunderstanding uh, treatment recommendations. And then lastly, um, not lastly, but close, um, assumptions that obese patients would not follow certain recommendations. A really big one is that people who are of size, and especially people who are really thin, they're excluded from medical research. And this is, if you think about it, very problematic. With medical research, right, we want to make sure that, that those results generalize to folks of the, uh, of the population. If there aren't, if there are little to no folks who are, you know, obese or folks who are thin, then we can say that those studies, uh, the study's findings are generalizable to everyone in the population because they're not. So what do we do? So the next steps that we have to take, um, number one, explore your biases with people who are obese and people who are thin. Uh, while immediately we say, oh, I'm not against people who are, who are uh, considered fat or people who are considered skinny, right? If you say that immediately off the bat without having to think about it, explore where that comes from. Is it due to uncomfortability with exploring your biases or is it, or is it due to the fact that you don't, you know, uh, or is it really due to the fact that you don't have these biases? It's important to remember that everybody has implicit bias, especially towards people uh, whose size are bigger or thinner. You also want to challenge the assumptions about health status and size. So while we have research to correlate obesity um, with hypertension and um, a hypertension and uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, and even to some extent predict it, we don't want to assume that that's the uh, that health size uh, that uh, excuse me that size is the only thing that predicts these things. They're not. Remember, people's genetics are really important when it comes to these other things, when it comes to cardiovascular diseases. 
We also want to include spaces for people who are thin and obese to actually speak. Um, whenever a person is talking about their experiences of sizes, discrimination, and oppression, listen to them. Um, and that goes into number four, right? We want to listen. Don't, don't explain their feelings um, because then you're, you're reinforcing the oppression that they've experienced. So we talked about a lot of different things today. We talked about um, sizeism. We talked about what it is, how it's conceptualized, um, and the attitudes uh, that are reflective of sizeism. We also talked about some ways that we can challenge sizeism, um, sizes depression in our lives. I do want to make note, um, sizeism while it you know while we recognize this as a form of discrimination it's not legally recognized as a form of discrimination so with sizeism it's a lot harder to fight but just because something's a lot harder that doesn't mean that it's impossible and using these steps this is one way of making it um of advocating and making it more recognizable um, as a legal in the in legality.